Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Twitter Spaces session on Food for Mzanzi called Gather to Grow. We have a full house tonight, full house of speakers, and I see that people are trickling in into the space to learn all about dragon fruit farming. Guguleto is, of course, my co-host this evening, my farming co-host, and it's so great to be in the space with her tonight. Gugu, great to have you with me again, and so awesome to be chatting about all things dragon fruit farming. Don't you think it's exciting? Hi, Dawn. It's absolutely exciting. I mean, dragon fruit is something that I feel is still a bit of an enigma in South Africa. People are like, we see dragon fruit at spa, pick and pay, Woolworths, but who are the actual farmers? Who is doing this? It's such a niche project product. So I'm really excited for the farmers on here tonight to really educate us and give us a different perspective of this exotic fruit. It is quite exotic. And I must say that I'm certainly feeling the dragon fruit fever because everywhere I look now in stores, I see it everywhere. It's even popping up on my timeline in terms of skincare products. It's quite exciting. I'm very happy to be welcoming our guest this evening. First, I'd like to welcome Lo DeVette, who is the owner of Firefruit Farm in Robertson in the Western Cape. Welcome to Gather to Grow, Lo. Great to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Dawn and Guguleti. It's an honor and a privilege to take part in the session. So yeah, I've been actually involved in agriculture pretty much all my life. Grew up in a farm and are still going strong. So we are quite diverse in, in what we produce, mainly focusing on different fruits, including apricots, peaches, pears, some citrus, wine grapes, and most recently, dragon fruit. Like you say, if that fever, dragon fruit fever catches you, it sort of sticks with you. So yeah, I've had that uh, since 2015, fell in love with the fruit and just started to go out in faith and, and start to produce uh, or grow and, and then produce the fruit. So happy to be where, where I am currently. For sure, it does feel like that, doesn't it? I guess it's because they look so pretty. Next, I have Lauren Strever from Amorentia Sweet Dragon Fruit. She's actually on the road, guys, and she's willing to still join us, even though she's, she's traveling. So thank you, Lauren, for coming through and for joining us on tonight's space. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Dawn. Quite similar to Lo, I've also been on our family farm my whole life. So I'm third generation. My kids are fourth generation. And we are in Limpopo, just outside of Zanin. And we're subtropical fruit farmers. And we also have a large nursery. So we're predominantly involved in avocados and macadamias. And also since about 2015, have introduced dragon fruit. My father is a, a plant enthusiast and he collects plants and we saw this opportunity for this incredible fruit and when there was an availability of these sweet tasting cultivars, we decided to bring it in and to start propagating it in the nursery and we are so passionate about it and see a really bright future for dragon fruits in, in our country. Thanks so much, Lauren. I think everyone in this space, all of our speakers joining here, will speak quite passionately about this crop. So there'll be lots of people advocating for it. Our next guest is Jackie Riddle. She's from Dragon Fruit Potency. Jackie, great to have you with us here on Gather to Grow tonight talking about dragon fruit farming. Hi, Dawn. Yes, it is the dawn of dragon fruit in South Africa. <laughs> I think it has a, a wonderful future. Being a woman in this farming venture, I sort of see dragon fruit as a little bit like a, a girly hand grenade. And perhaps that's one of the, the things that made me most attracted to it. I think the taste is great. I think it looks great and it's relatively easy to grow. So I think it's a tremendous future for farming in South Africa and wonderful opportunity. Thanks so much, Jackie. It's great to have you with us here as well. In my first question, some um, people also know that you were one of the first producers of the fruit in South Africa. So I'm looking forward to just hear your take on it as well. And then our final guest, we really have a full house tonight, Kugu, is Siatia van der Merwe. And he is from Aldri Farming. And it's great to have you with us in this space as well. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Dawn. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm the CEO of Aldri. It's a farming company located in four different regions, three provinces across South Africa. We specialize in the production of potatoes, onions, butternuts. We have advanced cattle and feedlot expansion as well. And then we 
started with dragon fruit in late 2016, 2017, and we needed to diversify. And we kind of saw it as the next big thing. And we're just trying to be ahead of the wave. And yeah, glad to be on your show. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Siete. It's great to have you with us. Google, I don't know about you, but there's probably like a hundred years, if not more, worth of experience on this space tonight. So I'm definitely going to ask lots of questions. And so many diverse farmers are not just limited to dragon fruit. So I'll definitely get them back on Gather to Grow for other topics in the future. But Google, I think that, as I mentioned, dragon fruit is certainly a crop that's been trending in Mzanzi. And, you know, I think I mentioned that seeing it in retail stores, but also in skincare products popping all over my social media timeline. It's really made me think that there's actually that this niche crop is actually a potential crop for new farmers to tap into. Let me start by asking Jackie Riddle, as I mentioned, South Africa's first dragon fruit producer, what she thinks. Does she agree? She said dragon fruit is the dawn of, of agriculture's industry at the moment. So obviously she agrees. But what is the things that new farmers should be considering when looking at dragon fruit farming, Jackie? Dawn, I think the most important issue is they need to make sure it can grow in their area. Dragon fruit is essentially a tropical, subtropical growing plant. It cannot uh, cope in an extremely cold conditions. So that would be, if anybody's farming in an area like that, it's going to be difficult for them to grow. Um, and otherwise, dragon fruit is actually relatively carefree. It doesn't take huge quantities of water. It's not even that fussy about soil. So as far as a beginner farmer is concerned, as I am, although I grew up on a farm, I grew up on a sheep farm, I didn't know that much about cultivating crops. And well, I have been in the game for about 12 years, but... It's not a difficult plant to grow at all. It's a very, very easy one to grow. For anybody starting off, a lot of the other problems that you may have with other plants, you're not going to find with dragon fruit. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jackie. Dawn, it is a full house tonight and I'm so excited because I really want to get at the crux of it. Why dragon fruit? You know, not a lot of people are even exposed to dragon fruit, what it does, the uses and the benefits. And I think it was Fire Fruit who mentioned that it's tasty and delicious. You know, what about dragon fruit made you feel like this is a crop that I'm going to grow? Jackie, you mentioned that, you know, it's a subtropical fruit in SA. Maybe you can also tell us the regions where dragon fruit is also popular, Fire Fruit. For me, it was, uh, like Siete said, it was where we needed to look at diversifying. But I was looking at alternative crops which included a few things, but the dragon fruit sort of, when I first saw it and I started doing some research, just stuck with me. So I decided to go ahead and sort of venture into it. And like they said, it's a subtropical cactus, but it is widely adaptable. So you can find it in all the provinces in South Africa. The main exclusion is very cold conditions. So if you get harsh frost and it's not going to last, your plants will, will not make it. But it's widely adaptable, different soils, different climates. In different regions, there's pros and cons. I'm not so familiar with some rainfall areas, but they definitely will get much more vigorous growth there than in the Western Cape, for example. But I think we have uh, some benefits in the sense that we don't get rain during flower and fruiting season, which is better when it comes to pest control and that type of thing. So it is a very exciting crop. What made me decide to go ahead was just the attractiveness of the fruit. And then sort of when I started doing research, I learned quickly that there's not really a place for bland tasting fruits. And I think all the speakers here can agree that there's only space for good tasting fruits. And you do get varieties that aren't good tasting. So I think the focus from the producer side is definitely to grow the right varieties and get those fruits out to the people. I think that's the most attractive part for me, Lo, the fact that you're saying, and Jackie also mentioned it, it's a very hardy plant or tree. But what are some of the shortfalls in terms of producing this crop? You mentioned that it might not be prone to a lot of the diseases, Jackie, that you have to deal with with other crops. But what are some of the external threats, maybe? Lauren, if you could come into the conversation and maybe share your input on this one. It's an interesting one because it does definitely seem to be very adaptable in different climates, um, as Jackie and Lo both said. But one of our biggest challenges up here is that we experience very high rainfall. 
in Limpopo in summer and that is when the fruit is is flowering and needing to set a crop and if you have rain on the days that you happen to have big flowers open the bees actually literally struggle to do the best job that they can in pollination so we've seen that as a challenge in the northern parts of South Africa and yes one of the things that was mentioned was birds because it is such a big and beautiful open attractive fruit it's attractive to birds and animals as well that can be a challenge in commercial farming there are some diseases and there are some other pests but it's not intensive as Jackie said to control those probably one of the greatest challenges at this point is that it is so new and unknown and it's such a learning curve so i think these little bumps in the road that we experience are definitely overcomable but um, we're learning as we go so sometimes it can be quite a hard knock when you are waiting for a wonderful fruit set you're waiting for a wonderful harvest something might a, a challenge but you don't actually know what it is yet but what is so wonderful is that the farmers are starting to to come together and talk and communicate and share information and knowledge through our new dragon fruit association of south africa i see that we will be able to overcome these challenges more and more as time goes on so for people who are coming in new they can know that a lot of the groundwork is already being done can i can i chip in there quickly dawn on i'm just following up on something that lauren brought up she was talking about the flowers and the pollen being washed off i don't know if your listeners are aware that dragon fruit flowers repeatedly throughout the summer season approximately a month apart but when it flowers one flower will open at about eight o'clock at night and then it will close again the following day at about eight o'clock and it never opens again. So there's only one opportunity for pollination. And that is what Lauren is referring to. So if you have a rainfall during the night or whilst that flower is open, the rain will wash the pollen off the flower and you don't end up with fruit set. We all want rain, but as dragon fruit farmers, we only want rain during the day, not at night anymore. Absolutely. That's very, very interesting. And I think I'm going to get more into how the pollination works then. And I mean, if it closes like at night, does it like attract bats or something like that? I think that's pretty interesting. And we'll get to that very soon. I want to move over to CT. Here I am. I'm a farmer, you know, I'm small scale and I really want to get into niche products like dragon fruit. Where do I start in terms of acquiring the seeds to plant my dragon fruit? How long does it take? Please maybe just walk us through that because I know that the propagation is quite different. If you could just uh, explain that for us. Uh, Google, yeah. You should actually ask that question to Jackie and Lauren. They can provide you with quite good planting material, but they would definitely be the first people to approach to get planting material and you would be sure to get the right varieties. So I think that's the first step. You have to make sure you get the right varieties. As Lo mentioned, there's a lot of fruit that are really not good tasting. So there are specific varieties that are really tasting excellent. So that would be the first step. And then if you are serious about getting a quick return, dragon fruit might not be the whole best option. As Lauren mentioned, there's quite a learning curve and we are still struggling to get a very good return on investment at this stage. I believe in the long run, there's a, it's excellent fruit and there's a huge opportunity, but we still have a pretty steady learning curve. But I think you can look at things like frost mainly. You have to have a bit of finance because your initial input cost is a bit high with the structures that you need to get in place. And then you would be able to get fruit within two years, I'd say, at the least. Thank you so much, Seth. Google has a follow-up question and then we do have a speaker, one of our listeners also wanting to engage Google, maybe ask your follow-up and then I'll ask Maura also just to ask his question. I just wanted to get a follow-up in terms of where do we source our seedlings? Is it a seed that we plant from? And CC mentioned something about structures. Is it like tomatoes in terms of growing the fruit? Do we need to trellis it in, in, in tunnels? I just really want to know where one can start with regards to producing dragon fruit in terms of from seeds, trellising and, and all of those things. Maybe Lauren or, or Jackie can take it. The dragon fruit is a vine. It's a cactus and it's actually a vine that grows naturally in forests and therefore it would usually use trees to climb up. And as a result, when you know if you're going to grow it commercially, we've got to give them as farmers, the plants, something to grow up. 
and hence what we do is we put uh, either concrete posts is usually the support system that farmers are putting up. They stand approximately 1.5 meters above the ground and farmers plant a cutting at the bottom. It's not usually a seed. A seed will take approximately eight years before it's going to give you fruit. So a cutting is what is used, which is just a, a part of the stem of the plant. And it roots very readily and very quickly. And it, at first, farmers will tie it to the post. And, but within a couple of months, it puts out aerial roots as it would in a forest. And it attaches itself to the concrete post. And then right at the top of the concrete post, one puts some crossbars, which encourage the plant to hang over and down. So the fruit will actually hang towards the ground. When the plant stems are hanging towards the ground, it will spontaneously start to fruit. There's so many different trellising systems, so that's quite an interesting topic because you can't really go wrong. The only sort of necessity, I would say, is that your structure needs to be strong enough. So you can do diverse systems. There's not a right or a wrong, so that's still open for interpretation. But I do think that going forward, planting method will be more, say, higher density plants. So I'd say up to 2,500 plants per hectare. And I tend to believe that single plants system we see in Asia was normally freestanding posts with uh, three or four plants going up one post. But I believe uh, in the future we'll be looking more at sort of one meter spacing, something like that between the plants. But yeah, definitely if you want to grow from seed, it's going to be a long while before you get any fruit. So if you want to develop new varieties, which is being done across the world. People select the best tasting varieties and they cross-pollinate them. And from seed, you can develop new varieties. So that's definitely something for specific people to do. But if you want to grow dragon fruit to get some fruit and returns, it's best to grow from a cutting like Jackie mentioned. But yeah, it's uh, still important to get the right varieties. With a seed, you don't know what variety you will get. Thanks so much, Lo, for that. I see we have a speaker here. Maura, please help me with the pronunciation of your name. I hope I'm not murdering it. <laughs> I'm Robert Maura. <laughs> Maura, Robert. Nice to, nice to have you with us, Robert. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very much. Well. I have never in my life heard about the dragon fruit. Even I, when I saw the topic, I just googled what it is. I think it's a very new fruit and a lot of people don't know about it. So my simple question, where can we get more information? Because, you know, yeah, okay. Wikipedia, you, are, you can get some information, but not that in-depth information about it. I want to know much about it because uh, next month I will be at the Dube, Dube Trade Court. We are having something there, although that's one, another for another kind of farming there. But since in South Africa, I would like to explore and know more about these fruits. I'm, maybe, who knows, it might be the next big thing in farming. So I would be very, very much appreciate to know where I can get more information about this dragon fruit, which I've never heard of it, so to be honest enough. And as I've told you, I've just go when I saw the name, I just googled it because just to know what is this kind of fruit is this. I don't know about it. I know a lot of lots about farming, but this fruit, no, I've never heard of it. Maybe it's new, and even if it's new, it might have, as I've said, it might be the next big thing in agriculture. So I'll be very, very much interested to know about it and where. I can get more information about the dragon fruit. Let me not say much because I know very little about it. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, exactly why we decided to create this space because so little farmers actually know that it's a crop that they can grow. So you can, of course, read more about it on Food for Mzanzi. We published an article on our Farmers Inside Track channel specifically mm -hmm. looking at the, the details about how to grow it. But of course, in this space is also a perfect place to learn and this space will also be available afterwards for you to reference or listen to on Food for Mzanzi's YouTube channel. So let's get back into the questions and just more about what it is that you need to know in terms of dragon fruit production. Let's talk about harvesting because that's my next question. Just in terms of harvesting, is it very labor intensive? If you're a farmer, how many agricultural workers would you need? Does the fruit need to be handpicked? What is it like on a working farm? Lauren, would you maybe like to take this one or see it there? Yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks, Dawn. We've worked out our costing on about four farm workers per hectare. 
It is less intensive than, than many other subtropical crops. That's my reference points. For low, it will be stone fruits and grapes. And, and for other farmers, it will be different. For siete, it will be potatoes. So for us, it's definitely viewed as less intensive. The fruit is harvested by hand at this stage. Um, again, there, there might be opportunities to, to advance in the future, but at this stage, it's quite basic. You have to keep an eye on the fruit by the appearance of the outside of the fruit and the color that it's turning. When is the right time to pick? That will be uh, different for the different cultivars as well. And that's been quite an exciting challenge, in, in fact, to learn. And sometimes it's the difference. Two days make a difference if you pick a certain cultivar a little bit too early, you won't get the bricks, um, which is the sweetness that you want out of the fruits. Like I said, it's quite basic. We harvest by hand. The fruit obviously needs to be carefully checked that it's in good condition. I mean, the, the, the bracts or the, the little, what looks like little fins on the outside of, of the fruits. I mean, you can actually get little hojos sometimes that bury underneath there. So if you're getting the fruit to look pretty for the supermarket, you have to make sure that it's clean. And, and obviously, that becomes a, a challenge when you're doing that on slightly higher volumes. At this stage, we don't produce a, a lot, so it's not a really big challenge. But for farmers who produce huge volumes, there's a lot of post-harvest IP out there that needs to still be determined and shared. And Jackie and Sieta might be able to share a little bit more on that. Thank you so much, Lauren. And, you know, speaking of harvesting, I think that's the best part of farming, right? We would like to know how much we're going to get. How often can you harvest your dragon fruit in a year? And I also want to just maybe go back to what you guys mentioned. You spoke about uh, pollination. I think that's so important as a farmer to ensure that you are attracting the bees. You said that it blooms at around, I think, 7 till, till 9. So then at night, does it get pollinated by bats and moths? How does that work in terms of uh, pollination? And how often do we harvest this dragon fruit every year. Maybe I can move this one over to Jackie. Yes, you're 100% right. Most of the pollination will be done by moths and bats, but there's no doubt that the bees play a large role in it as well. I've seen there are times in the harvest season that there are flowers and there are fruit at the same time. And we'll have guys busy harvesting the fruit and come four o'clock in the afternoon, the flowers are still closed, those that are going to open that night. But the bees are frantically trying to get into the flowers from four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So the bees definitely do play a role. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And then when do flowers start? It depends. I think up in Lapopo, they start to get their flowers season starts a little bit earlier than me. I'm down in the Eastern Cape. But I think South Africa can start to get flowers that open towards the end of October. And then once the flowers opened and assuming it has pollinated, It takes approximately 35 days, as Lauren said, according to cultivar, before that flower becomes a fruit. And this is the interesting part about dragon fruit is that the fruit can be green on a Monday and by Wednesday it is bright red and ready to pick. So it's a very, very last minute thing and farmers have to, at that sort of time, very aware of what the extent of how their fruit is ripening because you leave it too long and Birds will want to take their pick. It can happily hang another two weeks, but the longer it it hangs, the fins start to frizzle. So guys need to get in and start picking. You asked a question earlier. The only sort of problem with the picking of the fruit, it is done by hand. But as we said, these were cactuses and they have thorns. So the guys normally put um, long gloves on. You do get your fair share of thorns by the end of the day. I find the harvest period quite intensive because we like to get the fruit off and into cool rooms before the day gets too hot. And the other busy period would be the pruning period, the two high density times where you need a lot more people to help. Definitely. I just want to know how often is your harvest period just in a year? Like how often can farmers anticipate to have their harvest season when it comes to dragon fruits? Now that's what's so exciting about the fruit because you'll start to get flowers, say for instance, end of October. And then depending on the variety, but approximately four to six weeks later, you'll get another what we call a flush. A flush normally lasts about a week. So you'll get a a week of flowers end of October, another flush of flowers, let's say end of November, early January, early December, again in February and again late March. So it depends on your season, your temperatures. 
when night times start to get cooler, after the 23rd of March, you can see a very definite difference in the plant's growth and flower production. So there'll be areas in, in South Africa that'll get four flushes. There are other areas that may even get six. And each flush is usually a different number of flowers. So starting off early in October, the flowers are normally less. The next flush is a bit more. The biggest flush is usually in February. And then obviously in February, four to six weeks later, you are picking your big harvest. Can I just add with the harvesting, practically it needs to be cut with a sharp scissor. So you need a kind of a good quality scissor because some of the, where the fruit is attached to the plant, sometimes it can be quite thick. And you need very skilled and specialized harvesters because you don't want to damage the fruit in any way. So you need a clean cut where you do not damage the fruit. And you need them to be specialized in the sense that they know which fruit to pick. I find currently I have to harvest at least twice a week. So beginning in the week and end of the week to ensure I get the fruit at the correct times. So as uh, the other speakers mentioned, it's it's crucial to keep your eye on the, the fruits because they do tend to turn ripe very quickly. So yeah, it can be a challenge, especially if you are involved with other things as well. But yeah, it's very exciting. I find I get fruits from January up until July. Last season, I harvested my last fruits uh, first week of July. The winter fruits, though, they do not tend to to color up that red color on the outside because they need heat to turn the color when they ripen. So I actually found the fruits to be really sweet on the inside because, like Jackie mentioned, four to six weeks. But I found the winter sort of fruit, they even stay up to 60 days on the plant. So the interior is ripe and sweet, but the exterior may still be a green on the outside. So that's also quite an interesting fact. Thank you so much, Lo. I think there's so much to learn about this crop, Gugu, and I don't know if an hour is going to be enough. Maybe before we get to post-harvesting, I'd maybe like to talk about, you know, the local and export markets. And then I also want to talk about the cost involved. Maybe let's talk about the cost of production. And then we'll go to, you know, where are you marketing this crop to? Is it in South Africa? Are we exporting? What does it actually look like? Siete, would you maybe like to take the question around production? We currently, our cost is at about 100, 100 to 120,000 rand per day. But I think it is possible to do it a bit cheaper. At this stage, we're just trying to learn as much as possible. So we're not really looking at cutting costs. I think it is possible to do it but cheaper. And I think the estimate of what Lauren said regarding the labor is spot on. That's more or less what we use as well, if you average it out through the whole year. Awesome. Thank you so much, City. And, you know, just the farm and me is so curious about this dragon fruit, you know, because it's such an interesting fruit you know we really as robert has said that we haven't heard of it and we don't know what it's about and um, my mind is going right now i'd like to know just about you know the production of it in terms of like manures and fertilizers uh is it the normal npk that farmers should be using and in terms of maybe getting optimum yields should we be applying maybe some sort of fruit stimulants to it um how does it work you know is it just a conventional npk in terms of your fertilizers and manures maybe if you guys can just like walk us through also that part maybe uh ct on the i think on the the pest control side there's nothing registered at this stage so you have to control everything biologically which is actually a good thing i think at this stage we've learned a lot about biological pest control since we started with dragon fruit it was also a quite steep learning curve but i think it was definitely worth it and some of the practices that we actually learned from the dragon fruit we actually applying now on potato production and so forth so that's just on the the pest control side i think on the fertilizing side obviously you have to do your soil correction beforehand you have to check your especially your calcium magnesium levels are and then during the growth period, you have to be very aware of things like nitrogen, that you shouldn't apply too much nitrogen. And I think a lot of the consultants that we use tend to over apply the nitrogen initially. I think you need to focus a lot on things like calcium and potash. Make sure there's no deficiencies there, especially when it comes to the fruiting season. Thanks so much, Yetia. Let's talk about the local and export markets for this crop before we get into the post-harvesting process. 
Where are you guys marketing this crop to? We see it in stores, but do we have a local market for it? Low or Lauren, would you maybe like to take this one? From what we've experienced, there's definitely a huge potential in the local markets. And the fact that you said you're starting to see it on the shelves, it's starting to present itself. It is such an exciting fruit. And I think that's what so many people are drawn to. You know, it's got this exotic appearance. It's got this insanely beautiful color on the inside. People are inquisitive. People are very curious about what it is. The most important thing that we need to ensure is that people go back and buy it the second time. And that's where the right cultivars come in. The fact that people know they can buy a high quality, sweet tasting, delicious fruit, not an old bland tasting fruit. It's all about marketing and it's all about enticing and making the consumer excited. And fruit kind of does it on its own because it's so beautiful. Within our group, the Amaranth Sweet Dragon Fruit Growers, we struggle to keep up with the demand in terms of bigger retailers starting to show an interest, wanting to put it on the shelves. So there's a huge potential to grow there. And then that's without even beginning to look at the export market. And some of our growers in South Africa do export. They export their own fruits to Europe. There's definitely a huge market there to explore. I personally and our growers don't have any experience with that yet, but we've had inquiries and we've had conversations with certain marketers. We are excited about tapping in that potential when we have enough supply. At this stage, it's still such a small industry that's growing. It's always that sort of chicken and egg. There's an interest, but there's not quite enough supply, but yet the demand is there. But that will eventually catch up as the industry, as farmers develop more and more hectares. I can just agree with Lauren on what she said there. Just fact about the exporting. So the dragon fruit, we'll discuss this in a moment, I believe, but the post harvest is very important. And the fruits, if you do export, they need to be flown out. So it's air freight and it's quite expensive. But there is a big opportunity for South Africa since we are in the southern hemisphere. We have a gap where we, basically Vietnam and China, are not in production. So there's a a nice window of opportunity for us to export across the world. But I believe our main focus and market will be UK and Europe. So I believe that's basically going to be when the production in in South Africa locally becomes a bit, not saturated, but you need enough volumes to fill containers and pallets and to get that out overseas. So there's a lot of things that need to be in place, need to be a global gap certificate and the backhouses needs to be certified and everything. So exporting is, is a lot more intense. Me as Firefruit or we as a company, we focus locally. And since production is only starting to pick up, we try and, and produce and, and sell everything locally at the moment. I have currently three or more exporters interested in exporting my fruits, but it wouldn't make sense for me at this time. So I want to focus and, and educate and do a lot of informative branding and marketing of fruits locally to get people firstly interested and for them to realize the amazing health benefits of the fruit besides the fact that it's a good tasting fruit. So for me personally, local, I believe, is the main focus for me for the next two years until production is on a scale where you can afford to sort of export. But yeah, I think local, definitely if we can educate and inform people enough, the market, I think it's a very, very good market to exploit. Um, Absolutely, uh, Lo, I have to agree with you there. When you're speaking about local, it's like it because, you know, here we are able to produce or sell dragon fruit. And but still, you know, a lot of us, as Robert has said, we're not aware of dragon fruit. We don't even know the health benefits of dragon fruit. So I really wanted to touch more on to the post-harvesting process. Yeah, you know, you've picked your beautiful dragon fruit. How do you guys package it? How do you guys market it? And also its shelf life. Is it something that is sustainable to small-scale farmers who are thinking of maybe venturing into dragon fruit? You have to focus like any other crop. You have to have quality. You need quality. Quality always sells. And then you have to make sure that I think it was Jackie that mentioned it during the time of harvest when the the fruit has to be the right color when you pick it so that it's not too ripe. If you get that, it's not such a big issue. You have to get the color for each variety just right. And then if you have that right, you can get shelf life of up to 30 days quite easily if you keep it at uh, good temperatures. What I'm hearing over and over again, Gugu, is that it's definitely an option to go into for beginner farmers and even people who are just looking to diversify. I really want to touch on what Lo was talking about in terms of the health benefits, also just the value of the fruit. And maybe this can be incorporated in my next question in terms of the agro-processing options. Are we just consuming this as the fruit that you'd see, the pinkish, beautiful fruit that you see in the store that you can buy and peel or cut and then eat? 
or is there a way to make juices and you know i've seen the skincare products what are some of the byproducts that you could actually use and make with this fruit jackie maybe you can take this one yes i think this is one of the most exciting things about the fruit it can be obviously eaten fresh almost everything you do with a strawberry you can do with dragon fruit there's already a, a very big market for the frozen market so if there is any some skin damage on the fruit your seconds can be cut up or frozen for smoothies. It also makes an amazing ice cream and it's being used in, in that sector as well. It makes an excellent dried fruit. So once again, if you have fruit which is marked, you can use that so you don't have to throw it out. You can use that for, for the dried market. Also, it's actually almost nicer tasting dried. I've also done some freeze drying, which is a slightly different drying technique in which the fruit is almost like very crisp. And I think Woolies are selling some freeze dried fruits. And then there's also the market has been finding some sprayed dried dragon fruit, which is in powder form. And, and I think this is a, a very, very exciting sector because back in the 1960s, we used to use natural pigments for, for food, but they didn't have a very good shelf life. And they then moved over to chemical pigments for foods. And in recent years, um, the market has been moving away from the chemical vision and once again, Food scientists are exploring natural foods for pigments. And it, it would appear that one or two of the varieties of dragon fruit fit very, very well. They, their pigments are, are perfectly set for, for the food industry. And that's going to be a very, very exciting. We're busy doing some trials on some varieties for exactly that. And hopefully in a year or so, we will know for sure whether we're going to be able to fit in that sector. Then, of course, there's endless recipes, jams, cheesecake, Honestly, it's endless. The, the value-added products go on forever. They cook the flower buds for, in the east. They make spring rolls with them. The flower petals are used as something like a spinach. The stems are used in the skin industry. I'm busy experimenting with soap right now. It has very high uh, soapanins in it. It appears that even the aerial roots are being used as an energy tea. They say it's, it's almost as good as Red Bull in energy. I haven't tried it myself, to be honest. I think it doesn't taste that good. It's a reality. It is being sold in the East uh, as we talk. So it is new, it is but, and it's running at full speed. So uh, as Yeti has said, to get ahead of the pack is would be ideal for anybody who's looking for something to grow. It's a good choice. Wow, Jackie, you really got me excited about this uh, dragon <laughs> fruit. I love that, you know, even if it's like past its shelf life as um, a lower saying and overripe, you can process it, you know, into your juice. I know Kauai, uh, one of their red juices they use. And I'm always asking myself, where do they source them? Now I know it's uh, between you guys, you know, you guys are selling to Kauai. The value a- addition for dragon fruit is something that's a booming market for sure. When it comes to just your yields per hectare, you know, what are we looking at? How much does it weigh? I think, you know, farmers need some bad information. So I don't know who I can pose a question to, but anyone can take it. The yield range for dragon fruit, what are we looking at per hectare? It does definitely depend on the cultivar that you're going to be growing. You get a, there's a variety called Vietnamese white. And it has insane production. Unfortunately, its taste isn't quite as good as, as many other varieties. I think dragon fruit is, is subject to so many various issues that if you were to look at a perfect season where you don't get rain at night, you don't have any hohos or birds that come and eat your fruit, everything is absolutely perfect, which unfortunately I don't think you ever have as a farmer. But let's assume that you have everything perfect. I think you could probably, and you, you throw every nutrient, in you know, NPK, and you, know, you throw everything at it. The mycorrhiza is there, the mulches are there, the compost is there. You could probably get 30 tons a hectare, but I think that that is an unreasonable request of a farmer to expect from the plant. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that it's more realistic to be looking at uh, anything between 15 and 20 tons a hectare. And I think um, that is if you've got a variety which is a good producer. You know, you have all kinds of things. The fruit will split. There's all kinds of things that will happen. So I think if a farmer plans on approximately 17 or 18 tons, that's what he should be looking at. He could very easily realize more than that. But I think that's what he should be planning on and hoping for. If you do produce dragon fruit for commercial purposes, below 10 tons is not going to be, the math isn't going to be there. So you're not going to be profitable. So I think you should be looking at between 10 and 30 tons a hectare. But yeah, that will depend on varying factors. So it's very difficult. And in South Africa, the industry is so new. There's not really realistic data that's been built up. And 
most of the plantations are still very young and only coming into production. So it's difficult to say what we will realize in South Africa. But yeah, like Jackie said, I think uh, between 15 to 20 tons per hectare. And yeah, that's if things go well for you. All of this sounds absolutely exciting. And I'm surprised that none of our listeners are joining in on the conversation, Bugu, because usually they're quite active. But I'm sure they're probably just listening as attentively as we are to all of the responses. But as we wrap up the discussion tonight, I'd maybe like to ask all of our speakers here tonight just to share one tip or piece of advice in terms of exploring this crop as an option for the farmers on the space to diversify and look at it as an option because it's trending and because we're seeing more of it. And so everyone else can also get into the dragon fruit fever the same way I am. So maybe I can start with Aaron and then I'll go to Lo and then Jackie can take the final word. I think the most important thing is to work out how much land you have available and then work out if your location, if your climate is suitable to to producing dragon fruit. That would be the most important thing that you have to do. And then the basics in any commercial farming operation in terms of determining your soil type and quality and the land prep that needs to go into all of that and and water availability. I mean, those are the fundamental and foundational aspects for me. And always wearing my nursery woman hat, you know, you have people approaching you saying, I'm exploring this as a potential crop, whether it be macadamias, avos or dragon fruits, where do I start? That would be my 101. Thank you so much for that because it's, it's so exciting. I feel like you guys are really giving us some sort of incentive when it comes to dragon fruit. I think we didn't really touch on just what to expect in terms of maybe the pests and diseases. Um, I know you guys are saying that it's a hardy fruit, you know, it's cacti, you can even export it. But, you know, what can one expect? Um, I think it was Jackie who spoke something about the monkeys. And I'm just thinking about the region um, where I'm in. I'm closer to the northwest. What are some of the pests and diseases that you guys experience? Let's also maybe just, you know, be realistic about the dragon fruit production in terms of the negatives or, you know, the advantages. What can one expect in terms of pests and diseases? Um, Just that's like my last question. I'm sorry, uh, Lauren. We have experienced issues with birds. I must say it's been quite a problem and unexpected or just something we didn't consider. Uh, We also have experienced issues with monkeys and baboons, but we experience that on on our avocados as well, even the macadamias. You know, I think that is part of farming. We've got some beautiful natural forest around our farm, which we like to preserve. So there is going to be an element of risk in in that sense. And then in terms of diseases, they can be susceptible to fungal diseases. There's quite a few different fungal diseases, and there's a lot more information on those that can, you know, that people can acquire. So in high rainfall areas, that can be a problem, but it is also manageable. And often if the plants are healthy and if they've got good organic matter and healthy root system and they're living in a happy environment, a little bit of fungal infection, they actually often work it out themselves. And in terms of in-field problems, those those would be the most common ones that a farmer could experience. Um, and and see it here, Jackie and Lo, I'm sure, have stuff to add to that list. Kamau, would you like to ask a question to our speakers? Thank you. But uh, I think it's about uh, the diseases and pests, but uh, the question has been posed. Thank you so much. So you got your answer. And remember, guys, all of the speakers who are here, you can follow them on Twitter. You can also go to Food from Zanzi to listen to any of the updates, connect with them. I'm sure they would love to help. They sound really passionate. And, you know, in this business, in this industry, farmers, you'll always get someone who can help you and mentor you when you want to get started. But Lo, maybe your last word, and then I'll give Seto also a chance to just share a few final comments inside. For us as five food, I know Jackie and I'm a rancher, we have a similar focus. And I think it's important for the industry going forward that we supply the growers with the correct varieties and the correct plant material. So uh, we specialize and focus only on best tasting varieties and we go through a lot of it to make sure we sort of tick the right ones and we move ahead and we evaluate those over time. And you learn a lot. The varieties is just a fun fact. There's more than 155 varieties in the world. So we currently have about 75 that we are evaluating. There's some with amazing potential, some with less. So we are putting in the groundwork to eventually ensure that people can grow the correct varieties. There already is some that uh, people already know taste good and they can grow well and they can produce well. But that's the most important thing to sort of get the correct plant material. If you do not have the correct plant material, you will probably affect the market negatively in the long run. So that's very important. And there is like we are quite a few on this group that can be approached with regards to plant material. So that's probably the most important thing considering the plant. But yeah, it is widely adaptable as we said it's a very water wise plant but it loves organic matter so it will do well in a nice rich soil and jackie mentioned it's not 
that plant that you need to take that much care of if you provide it everything it needs. If you put it there, it will be happy. So ground cover is good. I use natural uh, plant covers. So we don't use any herbicides. We only remove the weeds we do not want. So that's working out quite well for us so far. And I believe it will be important for the future to cut down in, on cost, especially. So yeah, I believe healthy soil, healthy roots, healthy plants, healthy fruit. So it all adds up. If you just give the plant what it needs, then it will sort of nature will do the rest. Just make sure you don't get harsh frost. That's probably the main thing. And then, yeah, it's a learning curve for everyone. And it's a very exciting learning curve. So it's uh, for me, definitely, I sort of found passion in my life for the particular plant. So, yeah. I think there's one farmer in the house, Lo, who's probably as excited as you. When it comes to dragon fruit, Gugu, I see your hand is raised. You can take the floor. No, I am. And it really is. Uh, thanks to you guys. So thank you so much for even being here teaching us. Uh, thank you so much for from Zanti. Uh, you know, Lo, you really uh, touched my heartstrings there uh, when you mentioned that. I also wanted to maybe ask you guys about just how the world is moving into smart farming, tunnel farming, greenhouses. Is that something that we can also look into and get excited about in terms of um, producing dragon food, uh, trellising it in our greenhouses? I mean, you guys do harvest in the summer months. So when we are, you know, growing in tunnels and greenhouses that means longer growing seasons and it keeps everything warm is that something that we can also look into and as Lloyd actually mentioned earlier there are uh, different growing techniques in the old days well uh, back in sort of the late 80s in Asia they were planting on a pole and a lot of the plants are being grown like that now still there is definitely a new move to, to growing as a trellis system and there are people putting them under shade cloth more as a, a protection against extreme heat Putting it them into shade cloth only will protect approximately about five degrees for, for warmth. So it's not going to make a big difference by covering it with shade cloth for added warmth. It maybe will just prevent a little bit of ice. But we may very well be also going to go in the future planning a trip to Spain. And there's a farm where they are growing dragon fruit hydroponically. So that's going to be a very interesting trip to go and see how they're achieving that. And I think it's going to be a whole new world about how it's chemically treated, what the plants have been used um, what they're using by a water system. Across the world, you know, many people are trying many different things. And I think the wonders of social media are making it very much easier for people to learn. When I think about when I tried to start 12 years ago, I felt, you know, I had no one to talk to and no one could help me. If I can advise anybody that's starting out to find a mentor, often the people that you get the cuttings from will be happy to assist you with the growing and the cultivation, perhaps answer some of your questions. And I think that's really very, you've got a backup system. I know in South Africa, they've started a Dragon Fruit Association and members will be helped, I think, in the future. They're doing trials and things across the country. So hopefully in the future to come, many guys that come on board will be able to source that sort of information and help through the association. Definitely. And we value your inputs in the space tonight and also just allowing us to pick your brain, Jackie, as one of the first people who entered the sector. Siete, maybe you can also just share your comments as we close off. Um, what has your experience been like? Just the last comment for our listeners in terms of dragon fruit farming. It really is a extremely exciting fruit. It's unbelievably healthy. It's really, really good looking, tasty. And it's just one of those fruit that is easy to eat as well. So there's a huge opportunity. There's still a lot to be learned. And there's a steep learning curve. Lo and Jackie summed it up quite well. And maybe extend on what Jackie said about the association. Uh, that's the platform that we try to establish to get new growers into the loop of what has been learned so far. There really is, between all the growers in South Africa this far, there's a lot that has been learned from our side. So I think that's the best way. Don't learn from your own mistakes. Learn from somebody else's mistakes. Thank you so much, Kugu. We're done for tonight, but I'm sure there's lots of questions and people would love to know more. So if you do want to know more and find out you know, more about this, follow the advice of our speakers here tonight. But if you missed any of our discussion, it will be available on our YouTube channel. That's Food from Zanzi's YouTube channel. And of course, after every space, we post a story with highlights from the session on Food from Zanzi as well. Google, it's always awesome co-hosting with you and I felt your energy. The dragon fruit fever got you. <laughs> it got me big time, Dawn. Thank you so much for hosting uh, this uh, topic. I think it was something that we really needed um, as young farmers who are to get in the industry and not really saturate with the, all the existing markets, but look for something new and exciting. So thank you so much to the speakers. You guys are awesome. I really had a great time. Thanks, Dawn. 
Thank you so much, Gugu. Have a great evening, Father. And thank you, thank you again to all of our speakers for joining us here tonight. Bye for now.